My name is Dan Schlosser. I'm a product manager on the Google Drive team. And today, with some co presenters and some co demoers, we're going to walk you through how G Suite makes it easy to work with Microsoft. So, on the G Suite team, we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about how we can transform the way people work. We're helping your employees collaborate in all new ways, focus on the things that matter, and gain access to the information, knowledge, people that can help them perform best in their lives and in their jobs. And when we talk about this transformative change, it might sound great, but some of you might be wondering, OK, does this come at a cost? When I adopt new tools, is it going to slow down my business? Well, I'm here to tell you, no. Woo! And that's because we don't just think about transformative change. We think about uninterrupted business as you adopt G Suite. And we do that through a process called interoperability. So what do I mean by that? Well, interoperability is a fancy eight-syllable word that really just means designed to work together. And today, we're going to be talking about how G Suite is designed to work together with Microsoft. And when we think about this, it's a pretty hard problem. And to solve it, we've broken it down into three pillars. First is migration. Migration onto G Suite should be super smooth. And we ensure that with AppBridge, which moves your data from on-premise into the cloud, and change management resources that help you learn how to use new tools. The second pillar is internal coexistence. And we have this pillar because we know that no matter your strategy, there will always be a period where there are some users in your company that use G Suite tools and some users in your company who use Microsoft tools. And we want those two groups to be able to work together without worrying about who's on which tools or who's in which department. And finally, no matter your company size, you're always going to have to work with people outside your company that use Microsoft as well. So we think about external coexistence to make sure that G Suite users in your company can work with Microsoft users outside your company, like maybe your customers or your contractors or vendors. So today, we're going to be talking about the latter two in focus, internal and external coexistence and how G Suite's tools are designed to work together with Microsoft. And here's the bottom line. G Suite works seamlessly with Microsoft tools so that you don't have to worry about coexistence. So what does that mean for you? Well, first off, G Suite just works with Microsoft. There's no hassle, no fuss, and minimal configuration. Second, we're going to save your users lots of time and hassle, and that's going to save you lots of money on change management costs. And finally, you'll see that you can adopt G Suite at your own pace. And there's no need for an all or nothing, all in one migration. So to do that today, we're going to walk through a typical company workflow. We'll start by scheduling a meeting with Google Calendar and Exchange. Then we'll collaborate on Office files using Google Drive and Microsoft Office. And we'll brainstorm in real time with Google Docs. And to help us along the way, we'll use an example company, Inc. 42. Inc. 42 is a printing supplies company with a new line of pens coming out this fall. Specifically on this project will be Gina Sims, the product marketing lead, and Oliver Moss, the sales associate. Gina is in the marketing department, which is the early adopter group for G Suite. So Gina will be using G Suite tools. Oliver is on the sales team, which hasn't moved on to G Suite yet. So he'll be using Microsoft tools. And what we'll see is that Gina and Oliver are able to collaborate despite the fact that they're not using the same software. All right, let's get things started. I'm going to invite Ernesta up on stage to walk through scheduling a meeting with Calendar. Thanks, Dan. My name is Ernesta, and I'm a product manager on Google Calendar, together with Timo, who leads our infrastructure engineering team. We will show you how Calendar Interop can help your users schedule meetings with their colleagues seamlessly, whether they're on G Suite or on Exchange. So people often tell us that coexistence is easy to say but hard to do. But the truth is, moving to seamless coexistence using G Suite is now easier than ever. And in the next 12 minutes, 
I'll show you exactly what I mean. There are three things I want you to take away out of our time together. First, Google Calendar works seamlessly with Microsoft Exchange. Second, end users don't need to think about how it all works. It just does. And third, setting it all up is not complicated. It's actually super easy. The benefits of calendar interoperability are evident. It just works, so you can set it up once and forget about it. It helps you save time and money. There's no need to keep old legacy tools around. Google Calendar is enough. And it allows you to adopt G Suite at your own pace. And in the meantime, users on both G Suite and Exchange can collaborate seamlessly. All right, before we get into details, let's pause for a moment. We've been talking about coexistence and interoperability. But what does it mean for calendaring? And what's the difference anyways? Coexistence is the state of using multiple calendaring tools within the same organization. Interoperability is the ability of those calendaring tools to exchange information and to derive meaning from that information. So what's the difference? Well, this is Inc. 42. Some Inc. 42 users are on Google Calendar, others on Exchange. In other words, Inc. 42 is in the state of coexistence. Now, what you will soon see is that Google Calendar can talk to Microsoft Exchange, allowing your users to schedule meetings across the two systems seamlessly. And that is interoperability. OK, now let's get back to the story. This is Oliver's calendar. That's Outlook, the tool he's been using for years. He knows how to use it. He knows how to use it efficiently. But most importantly, he doesn't have to think about it. It just works. And this is Gina's calendar. It's beautiful, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it's also different. Gina is now using Google Calendar to manage her time. The question is, now that Gina and Oliver are on two different calendaring systems, how can they still work together smoothly? And the answer is, it's actually pretty easy with Calendar Interop. Calendar Interop is a service that translates messages between Google Calendar and Microsoft Exchange. In other words, Calendar Interop makes Google Calendar and Microsoft Exchange work together. And let me show you what I mean. And to do that, let's start with a very basic scenario. What happens when Oliver, who's on Outlook, decides to schedule a meeting with Gina, who's on G Suite? If Inc. 42 was still fully on Exchange, this would have been a straightforward task. Oliver would start a new meeting flow in Outlook, add Gina to the guest list, check her availability using the scheduling assistant, and send out the meeting invite. Easy. But Gina is on G Suite, so Oliver cannot see her availability. OK, so you might guess the two resort to a chat. Oliver says, hey, Gina, can we meet on Friday to finalize the plan? Unfortunately, Gina is away on Friday. But maybe tomorrow at 2.30 would work? Nope, doesn't seem so. In fact, Oliver is busy until 6 p.m. tomorrow. And if you remember Oliver's calendar a couple of minutes ago, it was pretty busy. In other words, this might take a while. But isn't this awfully inefficient? Yes, it is. But it doesn't have to be inefficient anymore. With a little bit of setup, by the Inc. 42 IT administrator. Users on both systems can
can now see each other's free busy information. And it's all transparent on users. So Gina and Oliver don't have to think about who's on G Suite and who's on Exchange. It just works. In fact, with the recent event details launch for Calendar Interop, Oliver can now see not only Gina's free busy, but her event details as well. <laughs> Thank you. And that is especially useful when scheduling meetings with busy colleagues. If it comes down to scheduling over another meeting, you would probably try and choose an easier to reschedule one-on-one -on -one for the conflict. All right, so what does this mean? Well, it means that users on G Suite, as well as on Exchange, can now see each other's availability. IT administrators can decide whether users see just free busy or event details as well. And it works on web as well as on mobile and in real time, just like in the G Suite to G Suite scenario. And before you ask, yes, it's available on Office 365 as well as your on-premise exchange servers. All right, so far so good. But Gina just got pulled into an urgent meeting with a creative agency. And of course, it got scheduled over her meeting with Oliver. So what happens when you need to reschedule a meeting in a coexistence scenario? If Gina was still using Outlook, she would open the event, find a time that worked for her, and send out a new time proposal. Now, you might think about that chat again, but today we are announcing Propose a New Time for Google Calendar. <laughs> Thank you. Propose a New Time allows you to send new meeting time proposals to organizers when you can't or don't want to move the meeting yourself. It's been one of the most requested features in Google Calendar for a while now, especially by customers that have recently moved to G Suite and whose users have been missing the functionality. Here's what it looks like. Gina clicks to propose a new time and can now see her own as well as Oliver's availability. She finds a time that works for everyone, maybe leaves a note to the organizer and sends out the proposal. Done. Now, benefits of proposing your time in Google Calendar are, first, users can view each other's availability side by side while working on proposals, which means that they're more likely to suggest a time that works for everyone. Second, users on Google Calendar can send proposals to users on Exchange, and they can also receive proposals from Exchange. In other words, it works both ways. And third, Proposing your time is avail available not just on web, but on mobile as well. So your users can act while on the go. All right, so finally, Gina and Oliver have settled on a new meeting time. But there's still one thing to do, booking a room. If Inc. 42 was still fully on Exchange, you would open the event in Outlook, find an unavailable room, Add it, and that's it, done. Coexistence used to make it quite a bit more complicated. There were workarounds that would allow Gina, who's on G Suite, to book rooms that are still stored in Exchange. However, they are difficult to set up and offered subpar user experience. For example, Gina might end up having to manually check availability of every single room in her building before she finds one that's actually free. So isn't this inefficient? We thought so too. And in fact, we have a better solution. And I'm very excited to announce Exchange Resource Booking for Calendar Interop. Exchange, uh, we will be releasing an update to Calendar Interop within the coming few months. And what this means is that Calendar Interop will now support seamless booking of Exchange resources from Google Calendar. In other words, if your organization decides to keep resources and rooms on Exchange 
during the transition period, your users on G Suite will still be able to benefit from Cal Google Calendar's intelligent room booking system. They will be able to view room-free busy status, filter them by availability, search them by name, and get personalized suggestions. And this is how it works. Gina just opens the event in Google Calendar, clicks on the Rooms tab, and can now see all the rooms that are available for the meeting. She might search for a specific one, add it, done. In fact, when she uses a feature a couple of times, Google Calendar will learn which rooms she likes best and will start suggesting those options above others. And that, I think, is pretty magical. All right, so what you've seen so far is that Calendar Interop makes Google Calendar and Microsoft Exchange work together. Oliver, who is on Outlook, could schedule a meeting with Gina, who is on G Suite. Gina could propose a new meeting time after an unexpected conflict and afterwards book a room that was still stored on Exchange. And all of that worked without either Gina or Oliver having to worry about who's on G Suite and who's on Exchange. And with that, let me now hand over to Timo, who will tell you how to make all of this possible by setting Calendar Interop up. Thanks, Ernesta. Hi, my name is Timo Burkhardt, and I'm leading the Calendar Infrastructure Engineering team. Um, so now let's get a little bit more technical. How does Calendar Interop actually work? And what do I need to do to set it up in my organization? You saw Gina and Oliver seamlessly schedule meetings with each other, even though Gina was already on G Suite, but Oliver was still on Outlook. So what's happening behind the scenes? Google Calendar is talking to Inc. 42's Exchange server using a protocol called EWS, Exchange Web Services, that's provided by Microsoft. Through this protocol, Google Calendar is providing interoperability with Exchange. I will now give you an overview of how to set this up in your installation. Enabling Calendar Interop requires a few steps, but we provide several tools that make this really easy. So let's first talk about basic Calendar Interop. There are three simple steps that Inc. 42's IT administrator will have to take to enable Gina and Oliver to view each other's availability. First, Inc. 42's IT administrator needs to create two role accounts, one on Google on G Suite and one on Exchange. These role accounts are used so that G Suite can log into Exchange and vice versa. Second, the administrator will need to enable Calendar Interop on the Google Admin Console. Here, the Exchange account credentials created in the previous step need to be entered. The administrator can also decide whether he wants to show free busy or full event details, as Ernesta just demonstrated. Finally, as in the last step, the IT administrator will need to enable Calendar Interop on the Exchange server. And with that, Gina and Oliver will be able to view each other's availability without having to worry about who is on G Suite and who is on Exchange. The second more advanced feature that Ernesta talked about was room booking, which means booking conference rooms that are residing on the Exchange server from Google Calendar. This advanced feature requires some additional setup, which I'll give you an overview of. And again, this is pretty straightforward. So first, rooms on Exchange must be configured to accept email invitations. And that's because Google Calendar internally is using email invitations to book Exchange rooms. Second, Google Calendar needs to know what Exchange rooms exist and are available for booking on G Suite. In order to find that out, we ask IT administrators to create a distribution list, aka mailing list, on the Exchange server. This mailing list must contain all Exchange rooms that should be made available on Google Calendar. We will then query this distribution list regularly to get the most up-to-date information of available Exchange rooms. And this gives Inc. 42's IT administrator full control over which rooms on the Exchange server should be exposed to a G Suite. So there's an optional third step. So Inc. 42 wants Google Calendar to be able to access and book Exchange rooms. However, those rooms should probably not be bookable by people outside of the organization. Um, to prevent that from happening, 
um, this can easily be accomplished by using um, Exchange email filters. And with that, Gina can start booking Exchange rooms directly from Google Calendar, just like Ernesto demonstrated. So as you can see, there are a few setup steps that need to be completed, but we worked really hard to make this seamless and fast. We are providing four tools um, that guide IT administrators towards that. First, we provide step-by-step -step instructions that are easy to follow. Second, in order to configure the Exchange server, we suggest using PowerShell. PowerShell is a streamlined way, a streamlined way to configure Exchange servers, but typically when you use PowerShell manually, um, figuring out what commands to use and typing those in can be pretty tedious. But we try to make this really easy. So what we do is we provide all PowerShell commands um, in the Google Admin Console for the IT administrator to simply copy and paste directly into PowerShell. Third, we provide a debug tool. So once everything is set up, things might still not work. But how would Inc. 42's IT administrator go about figuring out what's wrong? We build a debug tool that checks every single step of the setup and tells the administrator what's missing or what's not set up correctly. Let me show you how this works. In this example, everything is set up correctly, and the tool is confirming this. Let's see what this looks like in the event of an error. Something went wrong, and the tool fails to retrieve availability information. The information presented to the IT administrator shows that there's a problem with the role account credentials. Somebody probably mistyped the username and password for the role account. So the IT administrator can now simply re-enter those credentials and should be good to go. Finally, we have audit logs. As an example, you could imagine that interoperability is working well in the marketing department, but Gina is having some specific issues. The IT administrator can now look at these logs to troubleshoot Gina's specific problems. Here's an example of what these logs look like. We log every user availability lookup, so the IT administrator can find the exact request that fell for Gina. We also show detailed error messages, um, which make it easier to diagnose the problem. A final point I want to make is security. The interoperability and the communication with the Exchange server is happening using SSL and using password-based authentication, which provides the baseline level of security. However, a best practice is also to restrict the range of IP addresses accessing the Exchange server to those from Google. That is, Inc. 42 wants Google Calendar to be able to access the Exchange server using EWS, but not anyone else. This has been a common request from our customers, and in the past, we weren't able to predict which of Google's many IP addresses would actually access your Exchange server. But we now actually changed this, and we have a single IPv4 address block and a handful of IPv6 address blocks, and we guarantee that all requests to your Exchange server will come from one of those IP addresses. So this is great news for Inc. 42's IT administrators. They can now set up a simple firewall rule to only permit Google IP addresses to access their Exchange server. This will keep all the bad guys out, but let traffic from Google Calendar go through. And since we guarantee that those IPs are static, you set it up once and you never have to touch it again. And with that, back to Ernesto. All right, thanks, Timo. So let me quickly sum it all up. There are three things I want you to remember about Calendar Interop. First, Calendar Interop makes Google Calendar and Microsoft Exchange work together seamlessly. Second, end users don't need to think about how it all works. It just does. And third, setting it all up is not complicated. It's actually super easy. And with that, let me now hand over to Dan, who will show you how your users can use Google Drive to collaborate on Office files. Thanks. All right, thanks, Ernesta. So over the next few minutes, I'm gonna show you three really awesome live demos on how Google Drive makes it easy to work with Microsoft tools. The first is Drive Filestream, our native desktop syncing app for Windows and Mac. The second is real-time presence in Microsoft Office, which we're announcing this week. And the last is commenting on Office files in Drive, which is getting a new flavor, which you'll see later. All right, 
Through these three demos, you'll see that Google Drive just works with Office. So there's no hassle. And that'll save your users time, saving you money. And you can adopt Google Drive at your own pace because it works with your existing tools. It's not a full replacement of everything. So traditionally, working with Office files can be a pain. You email, you get a new email, and now it's final. And then, oops, now it's final v2 or final v final or something, and that's a mess. And uh, this can make it hard to find the latest version of a file. So take this scenario. If Gina's looking for the latest version, she might ask Oliver, do you have it? And if he doesn't, and it's on his laptop at the office, she might have to wait until Monday until she gets that latest version. So what's the problem here? Well, she can't find the file. That's no good. But she's also wasting time talking to Oliver when she should be editing the file. And if you're clever, you might have also figured out that there's a security problem here, too. Because if that laptop is lost or stolen, there could be company data that's compromised. So we can do a lot better. What Gina needs is a way to access and edit Office files without managing versions. Luckily, we have Google Drive. <laughs> and with Google Drive, we have a single canonical version stored in the cloud that can be accessed from everywhere. That's great. To create that canonical version in the cloud, Gina can save the attachment in the email to my drive with a single click. If she wants to edit that file using Office, she can use Drive File Stream. Drive File Stream is the easiest way to edit Office files stored in Drive using tools on your PC or Mac. It lets you access terabytes of data using hardly any disk space. And I'm excited to show you how that works in our first demo. So I'm going to invite Angela, who's playing Gina, on stage. And can we switch to Gina's laptop, please? Awesome. So before Inc. 42 moved to G Suite, Gina might have been accessing her files using an on-prem file server mounted as a network-mounted drive at g colon slash. With Drive File Stream, all of her files are located here as well. And just as a note, this doesn't have to be G. It could be H or J or K. I could go on forever, but you get it. Any letter you want, that's where Drive File Stream will be, which will make the change management here much easier. Inside Drive File Stream, Gina has access to her My Drive and Team Drives. She has access to all her files that she needs to do her job. On a traditional sync application, she would have to download gigabytes and gigabytes of data onto her machine, and all these files would be local, which we know isn't that good. So with Drive File Stream, it's a little different. We only stream the metadata of the documents in Drive to her computer by default. See here, we have gigabytes and gigabytes of data in this renders folder full of movies. We're almost getting that screen working. Bear with us. Um, and she can access these gigabytes of files using hardly any disk space on her computer. The setup is just in a few seconds. All right. That data isn't on her machine, but what if she needs to, for example, edit or take a read through some of the reports that she's been working on while she's on a train later this weekend? With a simple right click, she can make that whole folder available offline. When she does that, the files will be downloaded to her machine. They're there for her to edit. If she edits them offline, the changes will come back to Google Drive when she connects to the internet. Great. With the green check mark, we have all the files offline in that folder. All right. We should get back to business. She was here to edit that brief. So with a simple double click, the file is opened in Word, just like you'd expect. Now, what she needs to do is add some of the marketing message points to this brief. So she'll just add in a new bullet point. This is just using typical Word. When she double clicked that file, you might not have noticed because our demo Wi-Fi has been fast so far today, but that file was downloaded to the machine and opened right there. Now that she's done making her changes, a simple file save will save the file back to Drive File Stream and it'll be uploaded to Google Drive. She's all done here. So when she's done with her changes, the next thing she'll need to do is share it with her coworkers. The marketing team needs to review it, so she could share it with them. But easier than that would be to add it to a team drive. 
Team drives are content repositories that help teams work together more easily. Every file in a team drive is accessible by every person who's on the team drive. In Drive File Stream, these team drives are just folders like any other. So on the left, we can see that we have the marketing team team drive, and she can drag that file into the team drive just like she would any other file on Windows. When she does that, the file is accessible to all of the marketing team. In order to give them a pointer to the file, she needs to copy the link. Thankfully, that's now available from the right-click menu in Drive File Stream. Copy link, share with her coworkers, we're done. Awesome. There's just one more person that needs access, and that's Oliver. Oliver doesn't have access to the team drive, but she can fix that right now. She can right-click, share, the dialog appears, and she'll add Oliver to that team drive right from the right-click menu. The goal here is to make it so that all the actions that she needs to perform to do her job are accessible right where she is in Windows Explorer. All right. Thanks, Gina. We're all set for now. Let's switch back to the slides. Cool. So what did we just see? First, Drive File Stream is at home on the desktop. It fits in with all of her usual workflows. And it's mounted at the letter drive of her old file server, which reduces change management costs. We also saw that Word files open with Word. And all of your files will open with the native desktop editor that you're used to. If she needs to access files when she's offline, that's available from the right-click menu. Any file, folder, or team drive can be made available offline. Also from the right-click menu, you can copy link and share with some recent changes that we've made to Drive File Stream. Pretty awesome. So we also know that security is paramount. And Drive File Stream makes that easier because the files are in the cloud by default, not on the local machine, which could be lost or stolen. But we want to go further. That's why later this year, we're announcing that we're going to start reporting Drive File Stream usage by people within your organization to the device management console. No setup, it's security by default, the way it should be. Great. With Drive File Stream, Gina, Oliver, and the rest of the Inc. 42 team can edit the Office file stored in Drive. We know that's way better than this whole final, final V2 thing that we used to do. That's a way of the past. With Drive, there's a single canonical version stored in the cloud. But what happens if there are two users editing and saving at the same time? This is a traditional problem. I'll walk you through how it works. So let's say we have a file, and version 2 is the latest one. It's stored in Drive. Then Gina and Oliver both open the file on their computers and start typing. Then in quick succession, maybe Gina saves and then Oliver saves. These two versions that they both saved are in a race to the cloud. In this case, Gina wins, and she has the latest version for a few seconds. But then Oliver's version comes in and gets put on top. If Gina were to go look at the file, she would think, oh no, my changes are lost. They aren't actually lost. They're in the revision history. But this is a bit of a pain. And we can do better. Gina needs to be able to edit an Office file without worrying about conflicting versions. So some of you might be wondering, is file locking the answer? For those of you that aren't aware, file locking is a metaphor that's held over by, from the file server days, implemented by some other solutions. And what it does is it locks you out of the file, which is good. You don't have simultaneous editing. But it has its own problems. So is file locking the answer? No way. Take this scenario. If Gina is in the file and needs to get access, and Oliver is supposedly has it locked, she has to send him a message. Hey, get out of the file. Like I need to make some changes. But we've all had this situation happen, right? I just left the office. Sorry, you're out of luck. What's she going to have to do? Make a copy, and now we're back to square one. She has brief final, and you know we don't want to go there. So on the Google Drive team, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we could rethink this entire problem in a cloud-first way that fits with the way that people work. We call it real-time presence in Microsoft Office. And I'm super excited to give you the first ever live demo of real-time presence. So I'm going to welcome my two presenters to the stage. Let's take a look. Awesome. Can we switch to uh, Oliver's screen, please? 
should be number two. Awesome, we have a Mac. All right, Oliver is running drive file stream on his Mac. And inside the marketing team team drive, he has access to the brief. When he opens it, there's real-time presence right in the corner. Real-time presence lets him know that it's safe to edit the Word file because no one else is editing. So there he'll go. He has to add some of the sales points, and he'll keep typing away, editing the brief. But what happens if Gina starts editing? Let's switch to Gina's screen, number one. If she opens the same file using Drive File Stream, she'll also get real-time presence for this file. It'll say that she should wait to edit. And this is live, in real time, connected via Drive File Stream. She knows that she shouldn't edit the file. She can drill in and see who else is in the file. So it, in this case, it looks like Oliver is editing and Mike is viewing the file. We're doing this live with Microsoft Office. I know, seems opposite, but we got it working. So if we go back, uh, we can see that she could be notified if, when it's safe to edit if she wanted. In this case, she doesn't need to, so she can just click, got it. Whoop, looks like he was just finished. He saved a new version, but she's out of date. So all she has to do is click get latest, and that new version will be downloaded to her machine from Oliver's, and Word will be reloaded. We show downloading here because the version is being uploaded to the cloud and then downloaded to her machine. It's reloaded, and he's still editing. Stop editing. Oh. Oh, well. Well, in this case, if Oliver's still editing, maybe Gina is like, come on, I really need to make some changes now. What she can do is edit anyway. Remember, if we were in a file locking scenario, she'd be locked out. But in this case, we have collaboration, not file locking. So both people are editing at the same time. But it's an Office file, not a Google Doc, so that could cause problems. And that's right. If Oliver were to save the file, there'd be a conflict because Oliver would have new changes and she would have changes that aren't saved yet. Hopefully my demo Wi-Fi works out and we'll get a new version coming up in a second. What's happening here is that the new version will be saved on Oliver's machine, a new version will be created in Drive, and we know in real-time presence. There it is, and we can see that we can't just reload the file right now because then we'd lose Gina's pending changes that she hasn't saved yet. She could save them as a copy, which is a good fallback, but in this case, she'll preview and see the two versions side by side. This is super awesome. We have Gina's unsaved changes on the left and Oliver's saved latest version on the right. All she has to do is copy her changes from the left to the right resolving that conflict, and she's ready to go. Now, we'd love to be able to merge these two versions together for you, but we haven't figured out how to do that yet. You know, we got it with Google Docs, but we're working on it with Microsoft. But for now, with the merge changes, we're back to safe to edit. Thanks so much for the demo. Went flawlessly. Let's go back to the slides. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I love that. So this is collaboration, not file locking, with real-time presence in Microsoft Office. If no one else is editing, we get safe to edit. There may be viewers viewing the file, but we only look at people that have started typing in the file, be that Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. If someone starts typing, we get wait to edit. We can see who's editing and maybe who else is about to edit because they're viewing the file. And we can even start an email thread if we want to contact all these people and figure out what's going on. And if someone saves, a new version will be created, and we're prompted to reload. If we have pending changes, we get this awesome side-by-side -side view where we can resolve the conflicts manually. This isn't, isn't quite real-time collaboration with Google Docs, but it's as close as we're going to get. Really cool. All you need is Drive File Stream installed on either machine, and you're good to go. There's nothing else to deploy or configure. I'm excited to announce real-time presence is coming to Word, Excel, and PowerPoint this fall with Drive File Stream. Yeah, come on. So how does this work? I'll give you the uh, product manager overview. So 
If Gina is running Drive File Stream on her computer, we detect when she's typing in the Word file using native Office APIs. Then, when we detect that, we'll send it to the real time presence server and say, Gina's editing. If the real time presence server detects that there's another instance of Drive File Stream, this case Oliver, with the brief open, it'll send down, hey, Oliver should wait to edit. Then, all Drive File Stream needs to do is display a message on screen that Oliver should wait to edit. It's that simple. Great. We have all the edits made in real time. We resolve the conflicts. All we need to do is get feedback. So, what does that look like? Well, on an Office file, you might be used to sending an email, sending a chat message, or even creating a whole new document with all of your notes on the last draft. This is OK, but it's a little messy and can get confusing. Can we do better? Definitely. With Google Docs, we've been doing this for years. Comments are a great way of having discussion that follows the file. You can tag your coworkers, assign action items, resolve them. Works great. But we can do better for Office files and PDFs, and we have. Earlier this year, we announced that we are bringing commenting to Office files, PDFs, and more right from within Drive. This is great. Everything you know from comments like threading and tagging people is right here, right in Drive. Now, other solutions offer commenting in Office files, but no one can do this. We will take the comments in Drive and integrate them into the actual Office file itself. So comments made in Drive appear in Office. Comments made in Office appear in Drive. Super powerful. We do this by creating a new revision of the file that has the comment embedded. Let's take a look at how it works in our last demo. Great. Uh, can we switch to Gina's computer? Great. So in this demo, we'll pretend that she doesn't have access to Microsoft Word. And maybe she's on a Chromebook or on her phone somewhere else. And she, all she has is drive.google.com. If she opens the file, she can create a comment right from there. Let's watch. She tags Oliver, writes a note. Please review. Great. The action item is assigned, comments created. So what went into doing this? Well, first, we had to be able to render all these files right in Google Drive. And we've invested heavily in being able to, in being able to render Office files going back years, be that Word, Excel, PowerPoint, PDFs. We want to make sure all your fonts are right. We do our best. If you have images, they'll display here in more formats I can name. And if we have videos, they'll play in the YouTube viewer for the best possible experience. Then we had to be able to create comments. So that was tagging things in files. So that required being able to select text, knowing where all the text is, or tracking that across revisions. So as the document changes, we want to make sure the comments stay. And we want to make sure that all the discussion stays around too. So we'll take the replies and include them in new versions. But then what we do uniquely is we'll integrate them into the file itself. So we look at the file create a comment in the native format supported by file types that support comments like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and PDFs, and we'll create a new revision in Drive that has that comment baked in. Can we switch to uh, demo two, Oliver? Did you see this coming? When a new version is created, real-time presence will detect it. And if Oliver clicks Get Latest, the file will be reloaded after it's downloaded, and boom. There's the comment right in Office in real time. How about that, right? So these are real time comments from Drive to Office and back. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Let's switch back to the slides. So what we saw here was commenting on Office files in Drive. You can anchor comments and assign action items right from there. Those comments are integrated into the file and appear in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, or whatever PDF viewer you use. Super cool. Best commenting works on hundreds of file types. And where we can support it, like in the four in the middle, we'll integrate it into the file itself so that it can be viewed in whatever viewer you're using. 
works both ways seamlessly, and with presence in Microsoft Office, it works in real time. Thanks so much. I'm going to invite Alex on stage to talk through brainstorming in real time with Google Docs. Thanks, Stan. Hey, everyone. I'm Alex, product manager on Google Docs, and I'm here to tell you about Microsoft Office. I also realize I'm <laughs> probably the last thing standing between um, the end of your long conference day or maybe a happy hour, so I'll keep this to the point. So as Dan said, I'm here to talk to you about how with Google Docs you can take collaboration further and collaborate in real time to uh, brainstorm name ideas for this product. But really, I'm here to tell you about three features that the Google Docs editors provide to achieve seamless coexistence. So first, I'll tell you how you can import Office content into Google Docs. Then we'll see how you can leverage the new pin code sharing feature that we're announcing this week at Next to share a Google Docs file with anyone, even if they don't have a Google account. And then finally, we'll see how you can export back your Docs content to Microsoft Office. But before we get started, you might wonder, so why does this matter for me? Well, first of all, Coexistence between Google Docs and Microsoft Office means for your users that it just works. They can import content, edit it, export back if they need to. It also means you can save time and money by keeping users off of expensive Office licenses. And then finally, it means you can adopt Google Docs at your own pace, knowing that users in Google Docs will be able to collaborate with users in Microsoft Office. All right, so let's go back to our story. If you remember, the sales team uses Microsoft Office, and the marketing team uses Google Docs. So how can Gina share this Office file with her team who's moved to Google Docs in order to brainstorm product names? Well, let's see how importing Office content to Google Docs is going to make it easy for Gina to brainstorm with her team and be more productive. So to import Office content into Google Docs, all you have to do is go to Google Drive, bring up the right-click menu, select Open with Google Docs. That will import the content of your Office file into a brand new Google Docs for her team to collaborate on. Similarly, if the document was an email attachment but not in Gina's Google Drive, she could in one click click the Edit with Google Docs button, which will create a new Google Docs and add it to her drive for the marketing team to collaborate. Easy. But for import to be truly seamless, import quality is critical, which is why we're highly investing in it. And if this is what the document looks like in Microsoft Word, here's what it looks like in Google Docs. And as you can see, all the formatting has been retained, the table, the header, the image, etc. All right, so now that the document is in Google Docs, Gina can simply share it with the rest of the marketing team just like any Google Docs. And then in no time, you'll see the marketing team jump in the document and start collaborating in real time. And they can collaborate together and brainstorm really cool product name ideas. No waiting to edit or avoiding conflicts. They're all in Google Docs for best-in-class real-time collaboration. Awesome. So what did we see? So the benefits of importing Google Docs are threefold. First of all, it's available wherever your file is, whether it is an attachment or in your drive. Then it has high fidelity that will retain most of the content and formatting of your document. And then finally, once in Google Docs, you can collaborate in real time. All right, let's move on to the next part of our story. The marketing team has been able to brainstorm names, but Gina would like to now work with an external contractor to pick the final name. He's a copywriter that she's used to work with but it doesn't have a Google account. And I mean not even a personal Gmail account. So how can Gina work on this Google Doc with an external contractor who doesn't have a Google account? Well, let's see how pin code sharing, which is the second feature we want to talk about today, is going to make it easy for Gina and her copywriter to be more productive together. So pin code sharing, as I said, is a new feature that we're very excited to announce at Next this week. That will be available through an EAP announced later this year. With pin code sharing, Gina can share with anyone. She can just use the same sharing dialog and enter the email address of her copywriter, although this is a non-Google address. He will receive a one-time pin code and be able to enter the document. 
And just like that, the copywriter will be able to see the task that Gina assigned to him, respond to the task, and resolve it. So that Gina can now clean up the brief with the final name that they've decided on and get it ready to share back with the sales team. So Gina was able to work as seamlessly as she's working with the marketing team with her external copywriter in the same document, all together collaborating in real time. That is an amazing productivity gain. So remember, pin code sharing available through an EAP that will be announced later this year. Definitely watch out for this announcement. Because with pin code sharing, you can share with anyone, even if they don't have a Google account. You can avoid sending document back and forth. And once in Google Docs, you can simply collaborate in real time. All right, moving on to the last stretch of her story here. The document is ready, the name is finalized, and Gina wants to send back the document to the sales team, who works in Microsoft Word. So how can she, Gina share the brief back to the sales team who uses Microsoft Office? Well, this is the last feature we're going to talk about today, and we'll see how exporting to Office format is going to make it easy for Gina to work with her colleagues who don't use Google Docs. To export a uh, Google Docs file to Office, simply navigate to the File menu and choose the format that you want. In this case, Gina would choose Microsoft Word because that's what the sales team uses. Similarly, if she wanted to directly email the file from Google Docs, she could also do that. Just select Email as Attachment and select the file format that you want. It will export your Google Doc, it will attach it to an email, and send it to the sales team. That's it. All right, so what did we see? The benefits of exporting to Google Docs, well, first, it's available both for download and emails attachment. It has high fidelity that will retain the content and formatting of the Google Doc, including the comments or any suggested edits. And then it's available in many export formats. All right. So we've seen how Google Docs has been able to provide Gina with the feature set that she needs to achieve seamless coexistence with Microsoft Office. She was able to import the document from the sales team into Google Doc to then brainstorm with her team and come up with great product name ideas. Then she was able to share with her external contractor to pick the final name, although he doesn't have a Google account. And then finally, she was able to export back the content of the file to Microsoft Office for the sales team to review. All right, that's it for me. I'll invite Dan back up on the stage to wrap up the session. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy next. All right, let's wrap things up. So Gina and Oliver were, were able to collaborate even though they use different tools. G Suite and Microsoft work seamlessly together. And that's because we've worked hard. We've worked on tons of features across our suite to make it easy for you to coexist between Microsoft and G Suite. We've done it because uninterrupted business is key when you're adopting new tools. Interoperability is the way we do that, and we think about that through these three stages, right? First, migration, internal, and external coexistence. We want to make sure that the seamlessness between G Suite and Microsoft is the focus for us. OK. The highlight here is that it just works. There's no fussing, no fiddling. It's just coexistence and interoperability. When these two things work together, you save time because you don't have to deal with those hassles and money that you would have spent on change management costs. And last of all, you can adopt G Suite at your own pace because that all or nothing approach is the way of the past. All right, that's all we got today. Thank you so much for coming. Please rate us on the app if you like the presentation. And we don't have enough time for questions, but we'll be standing outside if you have any. So please come find us. <laughs> <laughs>